Right. Uh, so, is... your, uh... so <laughs> welcome. Welcome, Mary and Brian, to Paisley. I know it looks very like your living room, but yeah. it's a virtual. It's, it, yeah. it's a virtual Paisley. Um, Stephen and I have been running the Will Eisner Week for uh, a, a number of years now, along with Will Eisner's family. Um, did either of you ever meet Will Eisner? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yes. Both of you. Yes. Well, Mary met him at the one at the Spirit Con you organised. Was that? was that right? Were you there, Mary? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, I was. I was there. Oh wow! I'm I am honoured. <laughs> it was it was so busy. I couldn't really tell you who was all there. Um, it was it was very good. Yeah. Why didn't you come, Brian? <laughs> he was too busy. He's been found out, Mary. He's been found out. Anyway, folks, I thought I'd start a few yeah, years I ago. Will, um, sorry, I met Will quite a few times. I was in, in Brazil with him. All um, right. One, for one time. And uh, I remember once in Angolem, I actually uh, showed him around the town. I actually showed him the way from the Champ de Mars to the Hotel de Ville, you know. And yeah. He asked me to take a photograph on Ergé Street. Oh, yes, of course. Ergé. Why not, of course? Yeah. So I thought, folks, uh, I'd start a few years ago, head to the present, and then that should bring us by a commodious vacus of recirculation back to the past. You mm. should recognise that quote, Mary. I probably should. <laughs> it's from Finnegan's Wake. All oh, right. Okay. Um, I could have guessed. Now, <laughs> now, was your first collaboration the two of you, on the book about James Joyce's daughter. Yes. Yeah. Probably got your wine how, there, haven't you? How yeah. did that come about? Oh, I've got a wine, yes. Yeah, yeah. Brian told me to pour a wine, so cheers, yeah. everybody. Cheers. How, did, how did your How did your first collaboration come about? Well, I'd retired um, probably about a year previously. Mm. And I'd been working on various, finishing off various academic things and I'd more or less cleared my desk and I was looking for things to do. <laughs> mm. I was getting at a bit of a loose end, you might say. Yeah, one, one night we'd had a, a glass or two of wine and um, <clears throat> I happened to remember talking with this uh, poet, this narrative poet, Dorothy Porter in Australia who wanted to collaborate on a graphic novel. She wanted to, she used to write these fantastic, I mean, novels in poetry form, entire novels in a series of poems. They were, they were like herd boiled crime and things like this. They're really quite dark. Worth checking out. Yeah, and um, she suggested this collaboration. I, I came back and she, anyway, about three months after I got back from Australia, she died of cancer. Oh no. You know, yeah, she was, she was, 10 years younger than me at least. But uh, anyway, I suddenly remembered this one night and I, I said to Mary, hey, why don't you write a graphic novel now you're retired, you took an early retirement and I'll illustrate it. And she was a bit dubious at first, but- uh, It definitely wasn't going to be in verse. No. no <laughs> I was very clear about that. But uh, it became the first and only British graphic novel to win a major literary award. Yeah. yeah. And it was, I mean, I was a bit standoffish. Yes, the Costa. Yeah. It mm. did, it did. Amazing. <laughs> a bit hard to follow. Did you, did you write a I know. What, what are you going to do for an encore? Yeah. <laughs> um, working on it. <laughs> did you write a full script, Mary, and give it to Brian, or did you collaborate? I wrote a full script, but I mean, it took me quite a while to decide how I was going to go about it. You know, he'd, he'd suggested it originally as being autobiographical. The idea, the original idea being it was going to be about me and my father, relationship with my father, which was quite stormy. <laughs> and he knew my father. I mean, he was, mm -hmm. we've known each other since we were teenagers. So he was well aware of that. And that's what he had in mind, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was a bit iffy about the idea. So I thought, my father was a Joycean scholar. James Joyce had a daughter. There's a link. You mm. know? So I went and I wanted to do stuff about, about James Joyce's daughter, who previously I was vaguely aware of the name of. Um, 
and I was researching her for ages and hiding behind her, I suppose. But mm. eventually I worked out a way of doing them both, both together. And mm. I think the result is better than either of them would have been mm. individually. Mm. But yes, Mary did a full script. It was, it was almost a bit like a stage play. Yeah. You know, it wasn't broken up into pages or panels. I mean, now and again, you'd say there's a scene here with this happening, which would be obvious panel. But uh, I went through and broke it up into, laid it out, you know, broke it up into pages and individual panels. But by the second one, by uh, Sally Heathcote's Suffragette, you know, it was a full script. It was page one, panel one, group, page two, panel, you know, page. I got the idea about it. Yeah, yeah. So, got the idea pretty quickly. You'd done your apprenticeship. Yeah. yeah. And I've been watching, I've been taking notes. <laughs> And it was nothing to do with the Costa Award because Mary had started scripting Sally Heathcote before we were nominated, you know. So it was, uh, oh, yeah. you got the bug. And... Yeah. Well, was there, not, was there not a bit of a gap between doing the book and the Costa? Was there not a year or so elapsed? Yes. No, no, it no. Was it was nearly it, a year. Yeah, it came out in 2012. In February. And we were, yeah, February the 2nd, Joyce's birthday. And um, in November, we were just arriving at Bristol Station, going to this Jonathan Cape graphic novel event, and my uh, phone went, and it was our editor, Dan Franklin, saying, you won't believe this, but you've been nominated for a Costa Award. We were just pulling the station out of suitcases and things like that. Some strange joke. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Somebody's winding you up, yeah. <laughs> But, and then we weren't allowed to tell anybody. Yeah, about it. Said, don't tell anybody. So by yeah. the following morning, I thought I dreamt it. You know? yeah. <laughs> it's really strange. So with all these comic people, there with Hannah Berry and um, God's was there. I think Melinda Gabby and no, not Melinda Gabby. Um, anyway, um, and we couldn't tell anybody. <laughs> but we busted to tell somebody, you know. But um, mm. no, we had to keep stum till January, I think it was. Yeah. yeah. Till it was announced. Well, that's, that's, yeah, that was a gap. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but it's uh, it's quite something. I mean, when um, Mouse won the Pulitzer, it really made ordinary people, if I can call non-comics people ordinary people, it, it really made them aware that there was such an, uh, a genre, uh, as, sorry, a medium, not a genre, mm -hmm. as graphic novels. Um, so the Costa did much the same thing, I think. Would you agree? It did, yes. I yes, mean, it, all, it the, all the broadsheets, you know. And, uh, it got us in the papers, it got us on the tele national television. It was in the radio. On the radio. All over the place. And we started being invited to literary festivals. Well, we had been before, and mm. to certain extent. You know, I'd been invited to Edinburgh a couple of times. No, know, but I mean, so. on the strength of the... Oh, yeah, our daughter, yeah. Perhaps a Jerry Seen connection, because I think the first literary festival I went to was in Dublin. Mm. Um, that was in 2012, so that was before the Costa, actually, yeah. But on, most, right, of, okay. uh, most of them are afterwards. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. In fact, today, I mean, we do get invited to more literary festival these days and comic days. Mm. Even when they're on well, the... I, I, yeah, well, I think um, these days the distinction shouldn't really exist anymore. I mean, why should Neil Gaiman's books, for example, be on different shelves if they're all by Neil Gaiman? Why should a comic adaptation of one of his books be over there and the novel should be up there? I, I don't, why not just put them all together? Yeah. Would you, would you agree with that or yes i mean i always agree i don't think we need to sell yeah i don't think we need to sell the graphic novel as a form anymore i think no, no. it's just no. uh, accepted i still don't like the term so, you know, um, it's a it's just a marketing term really for a comics in book form but uh, no I'm, I'm a big uh, my one of my heroes is um uh, william hogarth you know, the father of British art, and uh, he saw no distinction between so-called low art and high art. Oh, Hogarth's one of my favourites. Um, mm. he's, he's my favourite ever English artist. Um, I think he's underappreciated. And mm. Jenny Uglow, I got to meet her at really? the Edinburgh Book That's Festival. Not... 
That's a great biography, yeah. It's a great biography, mm. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. First class. So how did uh, Kate Charlesworth has just been our guest at the Paisley Book Festival uh, with Val McDermott. Um, how did you get involved with Kate for, for one of the graphic novels? Was it a time constraint? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'd known Kate for quite a, many years. But um, yeah, I was in the middle of drawing was it Granville? It'd be yeah, Granville, well, no, the Granville <laughs> Bet Noir, I think. Yeah. And <clears throat> I was in the very signed contract with Jonathan Cape. And I, I said, I can't, well, I can't, I've, I've got a contract with Jonathan Cape to do this book, so I can't stop doing it and start drawing that. So I suggested Kate. But we did want to keep it, you know, keep it um, hands on. And, um, so I volunteered and Kate uh, accepted. I did all the layouts for the entire book, laid out every single page, every single panel, indicated light sources, um, eye levels, stuff like this. Did all the lettering, did all the speech balloons, did all the sort of typesetting for the articles, things like that. Um, and Kate, you know, did all the sort of research on the, on the costume. Well, we, we all did research, but, um, you know, Kate sort of, did the finished artwork, which is beautiful. She did a beautiful yeah, she job. Was perfect she was perfect for it. I mean, exactly she's really right into the artist. suffragettes yeah. anyway. She knows the period, you yeah. know, so she was perfect for it. She was, yeah, she was a great choice. I mean, <laughs> I said I just did the layouts, but it still took about three or four hours a page. Yes. But that's better than two or three days a page, like it used to take. <laughs> yes. <laughs> finished artwork. I, I think Kate said to me at first, she thought, oh, a lot of this work's already done, you know. What, what am, I, am I into this? And then, and then she went, Oh, wait a minute, yeah, all this work's already done. I can get on with drawing now, yeah. yeah. And she, she, actually, she actually quite liked it, yeah. Because again, uh, she's not a cartoonist that's really used to working with someone else who's not um, in the comics factory like 2008 no. or, or Marvel or anything like that. She's part of, uh, I suppose you could call it the underground. And where it, it, it's an auteur thing, she does the whole yeah. thing by herself. But it worked out really well. And also, it's not um, inconsistent in style with your other books. It, it looks no. like one of your books. Mm. No, it's very good. It's been so you can... successful in Spain. Right. It's seventh printing now yeah. that in Spain. Yeah. It's wow. just, just went really, I mean, all the books I've done with Mary do well in Spain. But that one in particular did uh, does very well. Why, why do you think that is? I think it might be because it's published in Catalonia and they're quite political. I was going to say that, yeah. <laughs> Barcelona publisher, yeah. 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 I have a different publisher for my other books, you know, who does Granville and Artright and that's Asti Berry. But, uh, but it's great. I mean, it's, yeah. it's won several awards in front, in, in Spain, Spain yeah, hasn't yeah, yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, the, the rewards just keep stacking up. Um, so are your graphic novels in general quite widely translated? Are they available all over the world or? Well, quite, yeah, quite a few places. I mean, Dotter even got translated, he got the Chinese edition. It's Chinese, yeah. After it won the Costa. <laughs> right. Probably got the most yeah. translations of all the Yeah, there's quite a few. It's been published in Serbia and Hol all over the place, Poland. Poland. Yeah. <laughs> Most recently in Norway. Mm. Last, last year, I think it came out in Norway. Lots of places. Mm. And one of the um, main exceptions in the world uh, that when I've been studying it is Russia. Russia <laughs> has got a great tradition of illustrated books, but it doesn't really have a, a, a native tradition of comics. And it yeah. took me ages to find even a comic shop, but there was one in Moscow. And there's, there's a publisher in, in St. Petersburg. Mm. But I finally found pictures of the shop in Moscow. And I thought, oh, that's great. I wonder what they've got in their shelves. And it was all Mark Miller's comics. And I thought, <laughs> much, as I, much as I like Mark, I was wanting to see some Russian author and, or some yeah, Russian subject. Yeah, well, we know, uh, I mean, we spent quite a bit of time with uh, Victoria. La Moscow. La Moscow, Victoria yeah. La Moscow. Was the Russian cartoonist. In, well, because we, we worked on the same book, this Trace of the Great War, 
that, that was published by the Lakes Festival and a French edition and, a, and an English edition. And we did a signing with her and everything in France, spent a few days in France. And then she came over to the to the Lakes, but uh, she was very sweet. She was very funny, you know, but doing signings in France. She'd have a piece of paper and people would come up and she'd, and she'd say, write name here. <laughs> and we'd write the name on <laughs> and she'd do it, but she'd say, yeah. You know, I am the most famous comic artist in Russia. <laughs> so things like that. She's really quite funny, but she was great. Meaning she, she was, was the only comic artist. Yeah. Well, that's, that, that's, that was my implication, yes. Uh, yeah, she I might be one of the few. So she recently sort of smuggled herself across the border so she could do a, a, a comic cover of the demonstrations in... Um, Belarus. Yeah, in Belarus, yeah. Belarus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's the yeah. Wow. Um, she was no, the Pussy Riot thing, you know. I, mean, yeah. I take it you two are still collaborating. Have you got something on the go at the moment? It's, been put, on, scripts, it's yeah. been put on hold, but yes, there's another one which is completed and um, the publisher want to see art work from Brian. Mm. First. I mean, they don't know what it works like. He's only been working <laughs> for I've been working 13 for years. 13 years and... Uh, it's see our editor Dan Franklin. He, he took early retirement, but he's still he's still the graphic novel novel editor in chief. There, he does it from home. So these everything has to go by the money men now. They have to okay everything, and they they've said, "Oh, we want to see some sample pages first. Oh well, you'll just need to get drawing. Uh, but I can't. I, I'm I'm really behind on the on the new art right book which I'm working on now and I've still got most of a hundred pages to ink of that oh um, well that should only take a week or so yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm putting it off I'm, I'm going to do the samples after that but uh, yeah they've had to put that back till spring 2000 uh, 22, you know, because uh, it originally, we were originally hoping to launch it at the Lakes Festival this year. But yes, but, well, there's no bookshops open in Glasgow at the moment. I don't know what it's like down your way. But no. um, the best way to promote a book is by doing signings and, and doing mm. talks and, and we're not really e equipped to do that at the moment. So I can see why the publishers maybe want to uh, hold fire for a wee while. Well, I think it will that, be all right. Not that, it's because yeah. I, was, I was going to miss the deadline. <laughs> oh yeah, well there's, too slow. there is that. But, too you know, slow. I, 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 I was supposed <laughs> to have it finished for spring and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be lucky if I have it finished for August, September. Uh, just, just just blame the pandemic. That, that, <laughs> that's, that's the way. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of art right, I think the first time we met was a long, long time ago at, um, during the reign of um, near myths in Edinburgh, um, which is where Artright was, wasn't it? Yeah, yes. It first appeared in uh, in near message published by the Science Fiction Bookshop in Edinburgh. Yeah, which was and, and, an attempt to do as a ground level comic, as it was called, inspired a lot by Metal Erlong and um, uh, Starreach. Remember Mike Friedrich's Starreach? Yes. I think it was Mike Friedrich who coined that term, ground level, it was this, it was this, opposed yeah. to underground, yeah. Because it was an yeah. underground comic, it was an adult science fiction comic. Yeah, and actually it was quite far ahead of its time in, in Britain, anyway. Yeah, um, yeah. Rob, Rob King was the publisher, but I'm not sure I'm not sure what happened to Rob in recent years. I think he was, he was selling memorabilia at one point, but... Um, he said, last time I saw him was in the... Late eighties, I think, and he was selling T-shirts. There's a T-shirt yeah. section. Um, but yeah, towards the end of Near Myths, because I edited the last issue, and I also, well, I edited number five. I also edited six, which never came out, because uh, Rob bought a lot of money, and he eventually just he did a Moonlight Flits, and yes, owing his landlord like three months' rent and. His landlord just went into this, he was storing all the near myths in his flat. The landlord went in and just binned everything. So that's why they're quite rare these days, you know, everything went out. But, you know, there's artwork there by Glenn Fabry. I commissioned some artwork up for Glenn Fabry, three pages he did. 
another artwork just went psh, missing, you know, it just went, uh, never saw it again. It, oh, would have, it would have been Glenn's first professional work. Oh, as, wow. it, as it was, I also got him his first professional work, which was drawing Slane for 2000 AD. I recommended him to Pat Mills. How, how had you met Glenn? Uh, how had you met Glenn then? Oh, comic, comic things. I mean, before I met him, I'd seen his his self-published fanzine, you know, he did with somebody else, he's a working class superhero, it was called. And he was only 17 and he was drawing, you know, his uh, anatomy and his drawing skills were staggering. I think, you know, Glenn, he's got more drawing talent, his little finger, than most comic professionals working today. I think he's, he's incredible. It's a pity he's not more sort of prolific these days. Yeah, down at uh, Mark Miller's convention in um, in London, Glenn showed me this work that he was doing, and he said, "Do you think it's all right, John? Do you think it's all right?" <laughs> it was this double-paged bar scene, and every single character was an individual mm -hmm. with an individual pose, and you could just envisage the bar and all those people. And I said, "Yeah, I think it'll be okay, Glenn. Yeah, <laughs> just keep, keep it up." Yeah. When he did Slane, the, the last issue he was working on, because he wasn't used to meeting deadlines, he'd fallen behind. And you know, 2008 is a weekly schedule. And I said, well, come, come up to Preston, where we were living at the time, and I'll link it. So he was actually penciling, just the last chapter, he was penciling it on one side of the room, and I was inking it on the other. And he'd pencil a page. And I'd look at it and think, oh, it's perfect. That's fantastic. And then he'd spend hours with these scrapbooks he had, which he'd pasted in, bits of photographs of bodies in different parts, you know, he had a whole scrapbook of armpits, and one of elbows, <laughs> you know, one, and he'd go through checking all the, or making slight changes and put little veins on or something like that. I said, well, it's perfect, leave it, you know. But uh, no, he's a real perfectionist. No, he always, he's a great artist. Now, Art Great has lasted, so when, when was Near Myths, uh, 70s? 78, yeah. 78. Artwright is still with us. I mean, it's a, it's a real, it's got real legs, hasn't it? Yeah, well, it's never been out of print. You know, it's um, been in continuous print all this time. I was just listening today. It's a coincidence, actually. It's not because I was going to interview you, but I was listening today to Audible's version of the Artwright thing starring mm -hmm. David Tennant. Yeah. And the, I thought, I bought that years ago. Yeah. <laughs> When, how did that come about? Well, Big Finish, you do the Doctor Who audio dramas and um, Blake Seven and stuff like this, lots of things. I don't know, the, the guy, Jason Hay Ellery, who runs the company, he just got in touch through the website, I think, and I said, he said, I'd like to dramatise this. I think, I think, yeah, Paul Darrow played, played uh, Cromwell, didn't he? Um, That's right, but, yes. Um, but, um, I thought that it was all right. I mean, they had specially written music and everything. Uh, I thought, you see, what works in one medium doesn't necessarily work in another. And I thought it took, the script was based on the speech balloons. <laughs> you know, read out, they didn't try to naturalize them like you should do for voices. So what works in what in speech balloon doesn't ne not necessarily work when you're saying it's a line of dialogue. So I hope they do that. I mean, they're currently, I mean, this year, the, the, they're doing the sequel, they're doing Heart of Empire. And, do, you, uh, David, do you know who's in that? But David Tennant is already reprised. He's, he's already uh -huh. recorded his outright bits for it um, earlier in the year. You know, because a lot of artists, actors are resting at the moment, so he just went in. And um, in fact, that's what's been holding, holding it up. He's been so busy since the first one, they've not been able to get him in the studio. Because of uh, COVID, they've um, <laughs> had some time in his hands, so he went in and recorded the, uh, the thing. Well, that's great. I mean, to get such consistency after all these years is, is yeah. amazing. I think it's partly down to when was it last year? When when did Good, Good Omens come out? It was the year before. The we year went, before, I think. Yeah. We went to see Neil Gaiman. At, the Royal Festival Hall, who was doing a promotional event for it. So it must have been the year before, yeah. because we've not been anywhere since. Big, <laughs> yeah, um, huge event, hundreds of people, it's immensely popular, Neil. And he put tickets on the door for us, and, and 
he said come backstage afterwards and he was there with what Michael Sheen and um, David Tennant who were also on stage with him um, being interviewed about Good Omens and you know I met them and uh, David Tennant was a lovely guy and uh, and I mentioned this I said you, you played one of my characters and he went oh yeah and he remembered it and I told him that they wanted to do the sequel and he said oh I'll be up for that that's great yeah and he's done it it's great great <laughs> So when when's that out, Brian? I don't know. I'm hoping the end of this year. I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not privy to the schedule. And obviously, the, the bookshops being closed. Mm. That's how I, I started ordering more stuff from Amazon, mm. and Amazon now comes with a free Audible trial. Uh, I have to confess at this point, I'm not that into radio. Um, there's not enough pictures for me. Um, I prefer I prefer my graphic novels and, and, and movies and television shows. But uh, it, 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 that was the first thing that it cropped up, um, Luther Arkwright, and I thought, oh yeah, okay, we'll try that. Um, I also saw that they were doing Sandman, but that's 11 hours long, and um, I'm rather busy at the moment, so I'll, I think I'll leave oh, the Sandman audible, for a wee while. Book, yeah. 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 But they're doing TV yeah, a, lot of, a lot of your stuff is available digitally. And uh, one thing I've appreciated uh, for doing research while the libraries are closed is a Kindle because I can get the book at the touch of a button. Mm. But unfortunately, comics don't look so good on a Kindle. It doesn't. It doesn't really work. I've, 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 have either of you tried to read a comic on a Kindle? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, that, that, that was that was a simple answer. Yeah. <laughs> Not worth bothering. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't really work. And no. um, I was saying it with length, double page spread and, and things like that. Mm. You can't you can't do a double page spread on a Kindle. It's designed for well, it's designed for words for a start. But it's designed for one page at a time, and that's not how comics work. Yeah. The screen's very small as well, isn't it? It's not. Well, you I'm can get, get fairly. Yeah. You can get fairly big ones, but it, it, kind of pointless. Um, uh, it's, to see the page, don't it's you? useful. For, yeah, it's useful for words. It's useful for doing research, get, getting a book instantly, and just making your notes while you're reading it. But. It's not very useful for anything with pictures in it. So, Brian, um, after Art Right, was, was that when you got involved with 2000 AD? Yes, yeah. Um, I mean, after Near Myths went down, it was, repub it was republished the early chapters in uh, Pst magazine. And I also did more chapters and then Serge published the first volume. And, um, yeah, I was... I was sort of doing bits and pieces for a while. I was doing lots of illustration work, professional illustration work and things like this. And then I got a phone call from Pat Mills saying, would you like to draw a nemesis? And I, I met Pat through the Society of Strip Illustrators and we'd actually sat down and talked about what we'd now call steampunk. It wasn't called steampunk then, I think we called it retro science fiction or something like that, a Victorian science fiction. Um, and I've sort of discussed this before, and as you know, that first Nemesis story I worked on, Gothic Empire, was about, you know, it was a <clears throat> basically a steampunk story. And I think I was working on that when you first got me up to Glasgow for one of the you know, your comic marts you used to do. Yeah, I think that's right, yeah. yeah. So so the, the, the steampunk, as we now call it, that was a collaboration between you and Pat, or, or did one of you think about it first? I, I don't know which came first, because, I mean, art right, steampunk, right, the definition. Yes. That came first. And the first time I met Pat, before he'd started Nemesis, he was saying, oh, I really like Ruth Artwright, I like this a retro science fiction thing you're doing. And then... Um, he wrote the Gothic Empire later after that. You know. Yeah, it's all just tied in. Yeah. And how did you get involved with Neil Gaiman and, and Sandman? I knew Neil when he was a journalist. 
you know, when he was writing articles for Nave magazine and things like that's that. That's the magazine. I keep forgetting the name of the magazine. That's, uh, that's it. He uh, did Alan Moore and... Um, I, I, was, I was there in the basement of Forbidden Planet when he interviewed Alan Moore for it. But see, he, was, right. he used to go to comic conventions, you see, and uh, he did a big feature on Watchmen when it came out for a newspaper. I was there when they did the interview for that with him and Dave Gibbons. But yeah, so I knew him. And then, um, what was it? What was the first thing I worked on? It may have been a strip for ARG, you know, the Artist Against Rampant Government Homophobia. Oh, yes, Alan Moore's yeah. project. He wrote... Um, 28 things. Mm. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, and he wrote it and I drew it. And I did a few handful of um, strips with him like that, including one for Knockabout called Sloth and uh, in the Seven Deadly Sins book. Oh, that was the Seven Deadly Sins, yes. Uh -huh. I knew him when, you know, um, he, did, he did Black Orchid for first thing he did for DC and then when he started doing Sandman. And yeah, issue 30, by issue 30, he was looking for different artists, I think, and he was doing, we well, was set in ancient Rome, it was uh, August, it was about Emperor Augustus. And I think he probably remembered that we were both huge I Claudius fans. You know, uh, Robert Graves' book and TV series. And anyway, he asked me if I wanted to draw it. I said, yeah, sure. So I worked on quite a few, actually, Sandman stories. I mean, there's only a couple of people remember, but I did the Augustus story. I did the Orpheus one, which is the big, long 50-page special. But... I also worked, I did all the framing sequences for the six issue for the World's End series with other artists doing the main story in the middle. But I also worked on things like uh, Game of You when Colleen Doran fell ill and they phoned me up and said, can you do 14 pages in a week, you know? Um, and then the same thing on the, the Wake, I think the last one it was the last one. The one with Shakespeare in it, you know, the, the Tempest one. Because uh, Charlie Vess had sort of fallen behind. Yes, so it was near the end anyway, yeah. Yeah, I think it was, might have been the final one, but uh, so they got me and John Ridgway and Michael Zuli in to draw some of the pages. I drew about eight pages. And then Charlie inked them in his style, you know, so they all looked, looked consistent. So I ended up working on quite a few. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I think 2000 AD, I think, got us used to different artists working on the same strip. Mm -hmm. And at first, it, it did seem kind of strange, but you, you kind of got used to it, I think. It didn't really matter if one week it was one guy and one week it was another guy. It, it, the, the excitement remained anyway. And Sandman is such a Sorry, you bro broke up. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Broke it's funny up. you should mention I Claude a nice. Oh, did it? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. I'm getting a message that, that the signal's weak. Mm -hmm. Um, it's funny you should mention I Claudius because that's exactly what I bought when the first lockdown started. Right. Um, and I got the nice package of uh, DVDs with all the interviews. Oh, yeah. With extracts from the original film with Charles Lawton, oh, terrific! I was, mm. I, I wasn't missing the outside world at all. <laughs> I think I've so, got that. I think that's what I've got. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So, um, how have the two of you been managing with with lockdown? Are you just getting on with your work, or, mm. or you know, much the same as normal? Really, not been going yeah. to festivals much, but. Mm. Working from home. Yeah. yeah, getting used to Zoom. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the only time we've seen our, our family in um, the last year is Zoom conversations. Yes. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I really miss, you know, going to the cinema once a month and going to restaurants and things. Or once a month we used to go down to, to London or Paris or something, you know. Yeah, miss uh, that. Miss all that. But... The rest of it, it's uh, working from home seven days a week. It's uh, 
pretty much uh, pretty much the same. We actually went to France in October because we promised we were asked to do it a while ago. We promised to do it, and they put on a big exhibition of artwork from the Red Virgin, Mary's uh, third book, Red Virgin: The Vision of Utopia. Because this year it's actually the anniversary of the Paris Commune, 150th anniversary, and they had a big uh, exhibition in Perigo. And they said, will you come to this festival near there in, in Basiac? And uh, so we said, yes, we, we actually went. To, we were quite lucky. It was all these windows when you could travel. Yeah, it was just before they went into lockdown total, in France. Total, in fact, they were, yeah. they were cl closing cool. and locking the doors behind us as we, as yeah. we left. <laughs> we flew back out to Toulouse, which has just been declared a hot spot. And we're on this plane with all these people coughing and everything. We were <laughs> So yeah, with the masks the, on. On yeah. the way out, it had been practically empty. empty. It yeah, was the, the nicest mm. air flight we've ever had, you know, mm. people distanced from one mm. another and everything, you know, it was the most comfortable one we've ever had. On the way back, it was crammed, wasn't yeah. it? Everybody was getting out of Toulouse mm. before <laughs> the lockdown was declared, you know. <laughs> so we didn't take our masks off or we refused the in-flight mm. food and things but on, on my website there's actually linked to this scary. link to this exhibition because uh, it was on for another um, couple of months afterwards at this uh, to the archive museum but it was that was completely different to being almost back to normal i mean we're wearing masks and everything but we're at a festival i'm signing copies all day and uh, yeah we're signing copies of red virgin all day things like that and then at night, we're going for these dinners with about 200 people. It's <laughs> 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 totally hard to imagine, you know. So. Yeah. I mean, the foot, foot, foot festival was down a lot, mm. as, but yeah, as they yeah. expected. You know, they got nowhere near as many people. Yes, of course. Which they usually get. Yeah. They usually get. But yeah, it was... Yeah. Were there any other British guests there, or were you, no. the, were you the only Brits? Yeah, we were the only English speakers there, I think. But um, it, was, it, was, it was real fun, you know, real fun three days you know it's great great yeah. change you know to go there yeah speaking french from breakfast to going to bed at two o'clock you know I mean, all day every day which is good practice i suppose <laughs> well <laughs> yes yes <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um yeah so uh, granville has finished is that correct yeah yeah with with the fifth one yeah. Um, Did you say they were going to do a, a big edition with them all in it or something? Yeah, that comes out in June. Um, the Antigral edition. In fact, there's two slightly different ones. The Dark Horse has, a different, has one cover that matches with the Outright Integral. And I've done a different cover for the Cape one, so it'll match with my next Outright book. It's, it's sort of like, uh, they're, very, they're quite similar to look at. This is, I suppose, we're trying to attract readers of one book to the other. But um, so it's not just to get me to buy two copies of the same book, no. <laughs> as as for Granville, uh, one thing I have been working on, no, making notes and things like this. What I, what I what I might do, what I think I will do, what I want to do, is after I've done Mary's next book, is to do. You know, in the last book, we we had introduced. Um, uh, LeBrock's detective and detective LeBrock's mentor had a, a backstory with it showed he tra uh, who was trained up to be a detective. And this with the, this guy, Stanford Hawksmoor, who was a big loving sort of homage, uh, homage to Sherlock Holmes. Uh, well, I'm thinking of doing a book called The Case Book of Stanford Hawksmoor, which will be set 20 years later at the end of the French occupation of Britain. And tell his story. So a spin-off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'd really love to do that. I think I've been thinking about it a lot. But uh, yeah, I, um, I hope readers of Granville are like the new art, right? Because it's not it's a different sort of story. You know, it's not as cute as Granville. It's not as uh, funny. In fact, it's not as much humour in it as the Heart of Empire, and quite a lot of humour in it. Heart of Empire was that, that, that was my Shakespearean one. And it had lots of sort of Shakespearean body humour in it, but uh, it had lots of references to Shakespeare all the way through it. But uh, this one, it's very different. It's it's a return to the sort of feel of the first one. Mm. 
and a bit of the experimentation of the first one. And it's in black and white, it's in the same style artwork, the cross hatching, which is why it's taken a long time. But yeah, it's a lot, um, there is some humour in it, but it's a lot sort of grimmer and hard edged than Heart of Empire and Grandville. So um, we started off with James Joyce and we kind of ended up there with Shakespeare, which sounds, um, which brings the thing around to a nice, a nice literary close. Um, I, I've just got to thank both of you for, for doing this talk. Uh, it will be, oh, it'll be released uh, during Will I think it's, I think it's getting released in the first of March. What's that Mary? I said, it's a pleasure to be in Scotland. <laughs> yes. Well, last year uh, at the Paisley Festival, I was trying to show Hannah Berry a gargoyle on the Abbey, and the rain was so heavy, we couldn't even see the Abbey. So <laughs> at least it's not raining today. <laughs> We're all dry. Um, well, thanks very much, folks. Uh, we'll maybe have you back another time. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.